So the topic is, uh, I don't know, I, I thought that by being here at school, using the maps and the, the, the board, uh, it was somehow make you feel here, but I'm realizing now that, yes, maybe it was a good feeling idea, but maybe not really practical, whatever, we make it work. So the titles up there, he said, he says, the actual history lesson of the Eastern Dalmatian Julian Exodus and the massacre of the sinkholes. Okay. So essentially, we're going to talk about uh, this um, coexistence uh, of Italians and Slavs uh, in the former Yugoslavia, and most precisely in what is nowadays Croatia, and uh, in a period that uh, I have here some timeline, and I'm going through this and explain you a little bit of the historical background, but essentially, especially during World War II, this coexistence uh, <laughs> ended up being of a massacre because the Titus, you know, the Marshal Titus uh, right. soldier killed the Italians in a very awful ways. At the same time, Italians that were there for a long time were forced to leave. Uh, and that's why the exodus, okay? Right. And, but, you know, when Susan from home office um, contacted me months ago and asked me to have this meeting, had a bunch of ideas of possible topics. When uh, 50 days ago, as we know, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine mm -hmm. or the, let's say, the Ukraine-Russian conflict started because you know that even uh, saying a Russian invaded uh, Ukraine could be politically speaking uh, argued. So since <laughs> we're here, in the I don't perspective- think you'll get an argument from me. Well, I mean, but it's important. It's important that we always. That's the goal of right. uh, this the meeting. Of the class yeah. I teach. The, the name of the class I teach is called Local Global, Global Perspectives. So we are always focused on different perspectives on different levels. Right. And, and so I thought all the parallel in history is very tricky and dangerous. So it's not so easy automatic that say, okay, World War II started because. Uh, Hitler wanted the Lebensraum, the vital space for the Germans, so he invaded Poland, and that similarly Putin is doing with uh, Ukraine. Yes, that's a possible parallel, but it's always, you know, tricky and dangerous to make a parallel, but there's one component that I think is very important here, is that coexistence of different ethnic groups. Is it possible? How dangerous is that? How, you know, you know, could be even a leverage, a political leverage that, that Hitler, Putin, other people have used in the past in order to take advantage. So the area that we're talking about, if you are familiar with geography, I have a map here, I'm gonna move the computer, is the former Yugoslavia. Can you see it? So we're yeah. talking about precisely this area here that nowadays is Croatia and Slovenia. So the Dalmatia is this part here. The Istria Peninsula is this one here. And the Giulia is the essentially nowadays both in Slovenia and the purely Venezia Giulia. So these are the three areas where one, two, and three where Italians lived, okay? So we're talk, gonna talk about this area here. Remember, nowadays, Croatia, Slovenia. You, of course, you remember a little bit of history of a former Yugoslavia, when in the 90s, there were civil wars among, you know, Serbians and Croatian and, and, and the Bosniak, uh, you know, people. So this is the year that we're gonna talk about. So let's move back to the timeline here. So. If we consider that area, going back to Roman times, you know, there were Romans there in that area. Actually, if you go to Pola, there is an amazing amphitheater that reminds you the Colosseum. So there are lots of Roman ruins or evidences still there because Romans were there until 476 when the Western Roman Empire fell down and then the barbarians, as ethnocentric speaking, we call them, but you know, population from Northern Europe and Russia came over and then there were especially two populations, the Slavs and the Avari. Quickly, we move on. Charlemagne in the eighth century 
wanted to expand uh, the Holy Roman Empire. And so he conquered this Avars and Slavs territory, which is uh, again, nowadays Croatia and Slovenia and Bosnia. And then the Venetians arrived. So the Venetians were there for a long, long time from the ninth century until the 18th century. So for the ninth centuries, they were there. So that's how we can see. And before there were the Slavs, the Romans, if you can see Romans, Italians, maybe we were there before. And then the Slavs, the Slavs arrived and then the Venetians arrived. But what I want to stress here is that the coexistence between Italians, there was not such a you know, concept now back then, but Italians and Slavs was peaceful. There was no conflict. It was just people speaking different languages, different having different culture, different habits, but they perceived, let's say ethnically speaking different, but not politically speaking. The situation became messed when, when in the 1800, and more precisely 1848, there was the so-called Primavera dei Popoli, the spring of people. The national, nationalism concept was more and more emphasized in the 1800. And so there it started the problem. In the meantime, the austrian hungarian Empire was around and then, he, the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire took over and those, that territory became Austria. So Austrian Italians, we were fighting because Austrians were also in the northern of Italy, um, Lombardia, Veneto, Trentino. We had several independence wars with them. So see how smart the Austrians were. So they use the presence of both Italians and Slavs there on their own advantage. They bet on the Slavs because they were fighting with Italians in Northern Italy. And so they gave advantages to the Slavs and they started to discriminate Italians that were living there. Putting them Italians in concentration camp, negating all kinds of uh, civil rights, political rights, and there was a strong Germanization, Slavization, meaning there was no way that you can speak Italian, learn Italian around there, but the only you know, allowed languages were first German and then Slavs, if you want. That was for a long time until World War I started. We are in 1914, 1914, 1918, right? World War I. And so, Italy, in that war, we fought in the right side, let's say, with uh, France and England. Okay. And, and the Germans and Austrians were our enemies. And we won. We definitely can say we, we won that war. And so because our victory, we were able to expand our borders uh, again there. So no more Austria there. It became another time Italy. So all the, the one that I showed you before, the um, Dalmatian Peninsula and Eastern Peninsula became again Italian. 1922, Mussolini arrived in Italy. So what happened? Both in Italy, but also there, Mussolini started to emphasize the Italianità. He wanted to be Italian, they wanted to recreate the Roman Empire grandeur, right? And so, especially in the, you know, in the, what we call fascismo di confine, meaning the fascismo nearby the border, that in that era specifically, Mussolini started to do what Austrians did with us. Italianization, no more speaking of any other language than Italian, discriminations, Supreme Court and execution of Slavs. So from 1922 until 1941, Mussolini and the fascism did exactly what the Austrians did to the Italians. It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, this, what I just said is very important because there are lots of people you will see afterwards that essentially were, con are, were considering, see, and uh, we're considering the Italians living there equation 
they were living there, so they are fascist, period. There was no way, so it was an easy equation, and you will understand more this afterwards. So right. essentially, Mussolini created this, Italianization, execution, no slaps, etc. And then 1931, World War II started. Italy will enter in the war in the 40, and we again invaded Yugoslavia because Mussolini was not only happy. With, oh, I'm speaking English. Sorry, I just realized that. Quindi, <laughs> let's go to Italian. Nobody said anything. Okay. Uh, so, quaran, so 41, Mussolini invade la Yugoslavia perché lui vuole espandere, vuole tutta la Jugoslavia, non solo il territorio che aveva. Quindi diciamo che la guerra, la guerra in Jugoslavia dura dal 41 fino al 45. Che succede? Quindi una cosa molto interessante, nel 41 quindi c'era l'occupazione italiana in German, in tedesca, but at the same time, look, we had multiple internal conflicts, in the territory, uh, Serbian versus Croatians, Serbi contro Croati, Italiani versus Sloveni. So it, there were conflicts within a conflict, which is, again, the coexistence of ethnic group that for centuries worked. Now they couldn't live together. They were always somehow fighting, although they had a common enemy. Italians and Germans, uh, they were still fighting and killing them each other. This is a very important detail if you consider the, what will happen in the civil war in the 90s, okay? Quindi, 41. Then we go on a very important date for Italy, una vera data importante per l'Italia, which is 8 settembre 1943. Here we are. 8 settembre 1943. È il momento del armistice, armistizio, cioè gli italiani non più con Mussolini e Hitler, ma con il generale Badoglio, stiamo con gli alleati. È una data importantissima, you know, Mac is here this year, and then we talk so many times about that because Nazi occupied Italy after that. The Allies started bombing Italy because of that. You know, Italy was destroyed by Allies, including Viterbo, where I am right now, because the, it was occupied by Nazi. And quindi la situazione, anche in the former Yugoslavia, Nazi occupied also that territory. Quindi la conseguenza è la Germania occupa la Yugoslavia after the 43, bombing alleati, quindi c'è un grande bombardamento dagli alleati, in particolarmente una città che si chiama Zara, was is called the Balkanic Dresda. Dresda in Germany was destroyed by the Allies. And then Zara was somehow like Dresda in the Balkani, was completely destroyed because Tito said, oh, there are lots of Nazi there. And so Tito suggested because it was his convenience to destroy the city because it was convinced for him, but actually there were no Nazi there, at least very little Nazi. Quindi bombardamento dagli alleati, a Sounds year familiar. Started, sorry? Sounds familiar these days. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Denazification of Zara. <laughs> exact, exact. And for the first time we hear, we see the Foibe and the Esodo. So we are talking about the Foibe and the Esodo after the armistice, after September 43. So for the first time, Tito, which is, it was the communist partisan, it was still a partisan back then, started to kill Italians in the Foibe, which later will explain exactly how the Foibe worked, and the esodo of the Italiani da quella zona comincia. Gli Italiani cominciano ad abbandonare lentamente quel territorio, abbandonarlo per tornare in Italia, ovviamente. E la guerra finisce, 45, 1945, quando finisce la guerra, un generale americano, Morgan, he drew a line, like if you are familiar with Cyprus, there there is a green line, right? Here there is the Morgan line. 
the Morgan line was dividing the zone A and the zone B, still there, we are up there in the Slovenia, Croatian, and Fiori Venezia Giulia area. Zone A was the under the British control. Zona B was under the Yugoslavian control. Quindi, there was no Italy involved because we lost the war. E quindi, they created a Zona A e Zona B controllata dagli inglesi e dagli eh, Jugoslavi. Quindi siamo giugno del 45. Un'altra data molto importante è 10 February 1947. Perché è la data del Trattato di Parigi. World War II is over. All the people, important people, were in Paris to meet, to, to sign the treaty uh, no, at the end of the World War II. Perché è importante? Nel Trattato di Parigi, l'Italia perde tutti i territori della, della former Yugoslavia. We lost the war, they say you're going to lose all your territory there. Trieste, which is nowadays is an Italian city, which is an amazing city, it was not Italy until 1954 because it was considered a um, free territory. There was a territorio libero di Trieste until 1954. And they reduced the zona A, the zona A became smaller, and the zona B bigger, so Yugoslavia got much more control and the English army have a little part of zona. Again, Esodo. So Italians keep, you know, fleeing and then escaping Yugoslavia. 1954, as I said, Memorandum of London, che significa che tutti accettano questa situazione e Trieste diventa Italia. Quindi nel 1954 Trieste is officially Italy. One important, so everything I said here, I don't know, you tell me. It seems not that there is not so much to argue, right? It seems pretty objective. Well, it was not that easy, I guess, that we need to wait until 1975 when Yugoslavia, with Tito still alive, in Italy signed the Treaty of Osimo which officially recognized the mutual territory. So essentially, when I was born, 75, they finally, Yugoslavia and uh, Italy, accepted essentially the borders as they were uh, decided both in the 47 and in 54. So only 40 plus years ago, let's say there was a sort of a, a pacificazione, okay, tra Yugoslavia. Tito muore, 1980, 80. Tito muore, e che succede? Conflitto in Jugoslavia. 1991-1999, con guerra civile, you know the story probably, no? C'è eh, Croazia, Slovenia, indipendenza, giusto? E poi abbiamo il Kosovo, la Macedonia nel 2001, quindi è stata una lunga guerra, è durata in sostanza dieci anni di conflitto. And then we arrive at 2004. Nel 2004, il Parlamento italiano decide di creare una data di commemorazione per le foibe e per l'esodo. So the Italian Parliament decided we need a date like we have on January 27 for the Holocaust, the International Holocaust you know, um, Memorial Day. And so we need one also for the foibe. And so they created this national um, date for um, commemorazione. Tu pensi che sia una cosa accettata politicamente? In realtà no. Dal 2004 fino a oggi, tutti gli anni, il 10 febbraio in Italia, ci sono conflitti per dire politicamente ah, il massacro delle foibe è un massacro comunista. E quindi i comunisti erano cattivi. Il 27 gennaio è la data della um, uh, liberation of Auschwitz, quindi è Jewish concentration camp, quindi i nazisti erano cattivi. Politicamente ogni anno c'è una polemica politica sempre tra una, una festa 
di sinistra e una festa di destra. All every year. And so that's so crazy. Still for me, it's crazy that I live every year here. Then I want to tell you the story. This year, with this group of students, I covered in global class both of this. So for the uh, January 27, um, Mac is here, so he did it. We did this a Jewish Viterbo, Viterbo Hebraica. So we have a local historian that took our students around in the city and showed them all the significant places where the Jewish community was living, where they were arrested, deported, etc. So we did that. And a journalist saw us, and the journalist, a friend of mine, he approached me and said, can I interview you? And then he took a picture of our students. We got this liberation, tutto quanto, and he published an article. Good. Everybody said, oh, bravi, SYA students, they celebrate and they study that page of history. Great. Two weeks after, we did the same for the Foibe. And, so, and I invited here at school one historian, one expert, and one exile from Istria. So the guy told essentially his personal story. The historian guy said, can I write an article because you know, it's so important for us that we give this evidence that we were here with these American students and our students were super prepared. They asked tons of questions. They were so you know, excited. Afterwards, I asked them to make an audio reflection on that and they were impressed by all the stories. And so yes, the guy published the article. Two days after the article, Another article came out. It was written by the local president of the ANPI, National Association of Italian Partisan. So partisan, civil soldier, the fourth, you know, in World War II. They are kind of lefty, you know, left-wing people. They essentially attacked me by saying that I was wrong. I didn't tell our students. They he assumed that I didn't say them, that I didn't prepare our students. So it was a attack, attack, you know, it was an attack. But yeah. it was assuming, historically speaking, that I didn't do a good educational, you know, activity with our students because I, I assuming that you didn't say this, this, and this, and this. Actually, I said those things that he, he put in the article, but he didn't know it. So by only mentioning that someone came to our school in the article, now, I can even share with you in the article, you can see the essentially the article was saying that this exile came to tell her his personal story. We got that reaction to 22 this year. So how to foretell you how sensitive is this article? And then I, this topic, sorry, and I am convinced even more that I was right because this is the kind of job that we as a school we need to do to confront different perspective. And before we got that guest, guest, I told my students, look, this is a very you know, delicate and soft topic all the time, this and this and this. So probably the guy is going to come, the historian, he's going to tell you his version of the story. But you know all of this. And so our students were so prepared and smart that they were able to, let's say, uh, use a different scale for understanding when he was a subjective and when some, some uh, objective data, which I think it's very important. Otherwise, if we just show them one version of the story, one version of the history, there is no way that in the future we're able to resolve a conflict that they were living right nowadays. Well, I live in Florida. So you've probably read about Florida in the news these days because they're banning different books, math and science books, and they've come out with laws about what teachers can say. So I feel like I'm, I'm living this situation on a daily basis here. Absolutely. People yeah. are so extreme in their views, right? And he brings their perspective in the history. I wonder this uh, partisan who wrote that particular article, is he an older person? And will this, as this generation dies, do you think it'll change? Yes, you hit the target. He's very old, he's almost 90. And then I believe that uh, in the article essentially we say Tito was fighting in the right side of the world. So he was fighting Nazi. So no matter what he did afterwards, because Tito, he was uh, 
a dictator and he killed a lot of people in Yugoslavia. No matter what happened after, he wanted only to recognize the knowledge that in that historical moment, he was right. Not considering nuances of, well, maybe he was right. I mean, even Stalin was right because he fought, you know, Hitler, but then he killed 20 millions of people. How, I, mean, it, it, I don't know, to me, this kind of a mentality is not, you know, mentality that can help us to go ahead somewhere, but just always look, you know, back uh, and then uh, with some, you know, retrospective, let's say, that doesn't help us and students to really understand the complexity of this. Right. And um, yeah, so that I want to that. So we, Essentially, if you see in only in 2020, so two years ago, our Italian president, Mattarella, was able to be with the Presidente della Repubblica Slovena. So only in 2020, meaning after 75 years, the two presidents were together on, um, on the edge of a foiba to commemorate, to, to acknowledge the victims of death. So that happened just two years ago with Mattarella president. So I want to show you here how the FOIBE worked. So FOIBA, no, from, it's a, essentially from Latin means it's a hole, it's a sinkhole, which is a, a geological, you know, uh, hole that was created with the water in the Karzik mountains uh, there, let's say above Trieste in that area. So a foiba is a, this big hole where people were killed in a very cruent and crazy and cruel way. So they were all connected on the edge, like 20 people at the time, all tied with a calf or iron uh, shred, thread. And only the first one on the line was shot on the head. So they were saving bullets. And by the gravity, it was fell, falling down and all the others, because they were tied together, they were falling down with him. So in this way, of course, the first one was dead, but all the others, they could be alive for days there. And, and so in this way, since these holes were so deep and they can be 150 feet or even more, 80, 90, 100 meters in profound. The, the, let's say, the rescuing of the body was not easy. And so there are still, nowadays in Croatia, Slovenia, foibe that never been discovered because afterwards, oftentimes they just close it here. And so you don't know where they are. Chi ha inventato questo? Allora, questo sembra che è una cosa che succedeva già da prima, accidentalmente, okay. nelle foibe che, che hanno trovato, era una cosa strana perché ci buttavano il trash, molto spesso, quindi hanno trovato trash, hanno trovato persone che maybe accidentalmente sono cadute, e ci hanno trovato cani, dogs, perché siccome una, una leggenda vuole che c'era una superstizione, e quindi se tu uccidevi cruentemente qualcuno, un cane nero, according to the superstition, could save, you know, your soul because essentially, I don't know, ah. una superstizione, non doesn't make any sense, ma in qualche maniera hanno trovato anche cose di um, cadaveri, di body di, di cani. Chi ha inventato, quindi è difficile dirlo, ma we know for sure that i soldati di Tito lo hanno fatto meccanicamente, no? Come, diciamo, in concentration camp, they always existed, right? Because we knew that. Do you Hitler... know how, how many people, more or less, went, were uh, massacred this way? Hey, guarda, here the sources have very <laughs> complicate. Someone says 3,000, altri dicono fino a 15,000, 15,000. Uh, we don't know for sure, because, again, the system was so, let's say, secretly accurate that we know we don't know how many for sure. And the, the who, who was killed that way? Was the importante? Of course, they killed first all the fascisti, all the people that collaborated with the regime. But when they finished the, the fascisti, they started with civilians. 
So we know for sure that a lot of civilians that maybe were relatives or friends or close to fascists, any sort of opposition of threat that uh, Tito felt it, those people simply disappear. And the cruel part of this, you, you know, imagine a relative of yours that simply disappear. And you don't know if, he, if she is still alive, what is it? Because, uh, you know, in this way, there are, and then I tell you the story of the, the guest that came here, his father disappeared for months. And so he, the, all of them were sure that he was dead. And miraculously, he managed to escape and then he showed up. So imagine living for months of years with the doubt, uh, maybe it's coming back, maybe she's coming back, and then nothing happened. So è stato, è stato incredibile questa cosa. Um, I want to tell you a couple of testimony about the, the FOIB as well. There is one story, which is a, it's an interesting story. There is this book, uh, which is called Norma Rosse, Cossetto, scusa, Norma Cossetto. E she was the daughter of the, the, when we had fascismo, we didn't have a mayor. We call him Podesta. Podesta was essentially the fascist mayor. She was the daughter of the Podesta, one little city in Istria. So when the Tito soldier arrived, what happened? The father escaped because he knew that he was executed on, on the spot. So he escaped and she and the family were there in the city. And so the soldier, as an act of revenge, took her, raped her for days and days. So in this book, there is also a collection of witness that uh, could hear her from nearby houses, uh, from the soldier, you know, how do you call uh, the place, the building where they were. And so, according to the, the sources, there were at least 17 soldiers that abused of her for days and days. And after she disappeared in one of the FOIB. That was uh, October 4, 1943. And, uh, and so, only recently, the guy that I invited here in the school decided to create a commem commem commemorative date for Norma here in Viterbo, which is called, Viterbo is famous for Santa Rosa. It's this saint that every September we you know, have this machina, it's this huge 36 meters machina tall with lots of, you know, Santa Rosa is, uh, I don't know, it's like St. Patrick in Ireland for us. And so the initiative of commemoration is called Una Rosa, a rose, for Norma. So it started here in Viterbo, and now after a few years, according to the book, there are also pictures here, this commemorative day is happening even in New York, in Washington DC, so all around uh, the world, in Ireland and everywhere in Italy. In New York, I can tell you because in New York, no, in Washington is, in, in, uh, near, is um, on the Guglielmo Marconi statue. In New York, I don't know, in New York, they just put it a rose. So we know for sure that somewhere happened in New York as well. So every year, October 4, there is this commemorative, commemorative uh, let's say, initiative or ceremony for Norma Cosetto. And uh, another story that uh, I show to our students here, it was uh, the story of a guy that managed to survive to one of this. And so I didn't meet him because, you know, the video showed the students, the guy was old already years ago. So in this video documentary, he, he, show, he tells the story by saying that when he fell down, there was water here. And so the water helped him to, what they call, amortize. Push in, like, push in the fall, yeah. Push in the fall, exactly. And so, but most of the people that were with him, they sank because they were tied with, you know, with a calf. He, he doesn't know how managed to free himself and then to climb somehow back to the out. Quindi è stato un miracolo, una cosa particolarissima, perché è uno dei pochissimi che 
è riuscito a scappare con situazioni, come dire, fortunate e miracolose e quindi è uscito e ha raccontato la sua storia ma tutti gli altri praticamente che erano dentro sono morti in quella maniera quindi ha raccontato con molti particolari duri, molto duri di, di questa storia e immaginate che non ci sono, per esempio, no? Eh, Jason, tu ti occupi di film eh, you are in the film industry so there are lots of movies about anything if you want during World War II but there are no movies about this, this stuff no, I can't and, believe I've never heard of it before yeah, and even in Italy there is still, as I said anytime that anyone says something about this it's tricky, it's, it's dangerous it's not something that uh, uh, can be accepted or can be, you know, even discussed openly. And then um, it's, it's a shame because again, and this is, I hope I gave you not only the Italian perspective, of course, in this story here, the victims are Italians, but we know for sure that during the fascismo, the victims were Slavs. And so it's not that, uh, in one of the book I read you know, about this topic is it's not a justification. There is no justification of revenge. So since you did this, because the Austrians before and then the Italians, so there's no justification. You need to talk about this. You need to teach this stuff. And the students can take the lesson they want, but it's important that we talk about this you know, conflict for having possible resolution in the future, because this is not a way of resolving anything. Right. Yeah. And um, I think the most interesting thing is the nine centuries that everybody was able to get along. Absolutely. I mean, nowadays we, we see this race of uh, nationalism, you know, everywhere in America, in Europe, uh, I mean, see Russia and I mean, China, <laughs> everywhere. So the nation, is still, you know, the polar, you know, star that guides all our initiatives, all our policy, or, you know, foreign policy and internal policy, whatever. But uh, if you see here, the, the problem started in the 1800 when the, con the, con the concept of a nation became so powerful that we started not to recognize each other as, oh, he's Slavs, he speaks Slavs. No, he's Slav, he's my enemy. So, the idea of a nation somehow is implied with uh, us and them. If you create an us and them, uh, we ended up probably to have a, a possible conflict if there is uh, some uh, kind of issue that you want to resolve, especially if you live in the same territory. See who the Tutsi, if you want, see nowadays uh, with uh, Russia and Ukraine, and then um, in World War II, the same, this, equal this, the civil war in Yugoslavia again and polarization is not helping no of course not it always seems to be about um power um that is able to mass control through fear and you know that that's the rise of fascism that's the definition of the rise of fascism is being able to control the populace through fear and through, like you said, pitting us versus them so that people stop even understanding who their fellow human beings are, you know? Yeah. They only... But that's the not the issue is, Yeah, Sorry. no, what the basic issue is, you know, because it becomes such rhetoric. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's happening in a lot of countries with, you know, political polarization. So I know for sure in America, you know, discussion between uh, Democrats and Republicans are not possible. I mean, there are still more and more advice that uh, it's hard to have a real conversation and confrontation about, you know, themes uh, that we think differently. Here in Italy, exactly the same. See no. in France, uh, Le Pen, Macron, everywhere. Yeah. This, this everywhere. No, because, because we see there's a few people who are making a power grab and the only way they can make the power grab is through disinformation and sowing hate. You know, and the only way that's possible is if there's a mass of people who are underclass, who are desperate, scared, 
And when they're afraid, they, you can believe anything, you know? The, there is one final part of the story that I want to share with you, and then, uh, and then we can finish. It was about the Exodus. So mm. I told you about the Exodus. Uh, we're talking about 300 or 350,000 that left uh, uh, the uh, uh, Zara and the Istria and the Dalmatia. 300, 350,000 from 43 until 54. We're talking about, let's say, even, even more. So let's say more or less 15 years. In 15 years, over 300,000 people left the Dalmatia and then from Zara, Fiume, Pola. These are the most famous cities. They went back to Italy. The crazy story when I, we had this guest and I have also a friend of mine that I just discovered recently that she had um, Eastern and uh, uh, Dalmatian parents. Uh, when they came back to Italy, Italians were not happy with them. So you think that these people were living there, suffering essentially the persecution of Tito soldier, they decided to go back to Italy, their you know, homeland, and the Italians were accusing them to be fascist. So they didn't welcome them, not at all. So the assumption was, well, especially from communist people, well, you are living in paradise. You are living in a communist country. Why are you living? You must be fascist. So that was the assumption. So for these people, fleeing Tito's persecution and going back to Italy was a double shame. And speaking of shame, there, there was a infamous or famous train chiamato il treno della vergogna. You know, they fle flew from the uh, Istria Dalmatia, both with the boat or with the train or sometimes with cars. But when they flew from uh, um, Zara, they were going to Ancona. Ancona is a port in the center of mm -hmm. Italy. Right. From Ancona, the infrastructure allows them to go from Ancona either to the south or to the north with train because every big city of Italy were kind of accepting or getting, if you want, those exiles. So one train left Ancona and then it was heading to the north. He stopped to Bologna. He needed to stop in Bologna. Bologna, traditionally speaking, is communist. a yes, exactly, is a communist and red city. Imagine in the after World War II, partisans were all there because the partisan movement in Emilia Romagna was so powerful. So they didn't allow the train to stop in Bologna. They threatened the people to say, "We're going to have a strike and we're going to assault the train because there there are fascists." And so, but the testimony of the people that were on the train, they were three years old babies. They were women, they were old people, they were all kind of people. So they, there is no way that a baby, three years old baby can be a fascist. So they didn't allow to have milk to these children and that just uh, spill out the, the, the milk in front of the rails to prove that they were not giving the milk to that people because they were fascist. Il treno della vergogna. That's interesting. So, huh. it, it, I, it, I uh, it, actually studied in Bologna also. I studied there at Johns Hopkins um, School. Uh, and in fact, I just made um, plans to go to my reunion um, in June, 35 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, Bologna is a fantastic city. Nowadays, it's a very open minded city, one of the yes, most open minded cities. But back then, after World War II, this is, you know, again, but even when I, Yeah, even when I was there, I remember being fascinated because as an American, you know, communists were like such a foreign thing, right? And um, they had the PGE, the, uh, the communist festival. And I have a great picture of me like holding a plant I got at the, at the fair in front of a big sign with the sickle, you know, and- um, The hammer. I shocked all my American relatives by sending this photo home to them. <laughs> I mean, ideologists uh, during Cold War, I mean, were creating this kind of uh, enemies, you know, you, they were able to see enemies everywhere. 
you know, there are interesting stories also about partisans, another very delicate topic, because a few yes. days ago was a liberation day in Italy, April 25th and 25th. And so if you say that, I mean, partisan, it's true, they freed Italy. They freed Italy from Nazis. That's true. And definitely in the north of Italy, that was true. But there were also criminals. I mean, they were both true. I mean, they killed people for personal revenges. They killed people because for pers political revenges. They killed priests because they were communists. I mean, they're both stories true. They freed Italy, but it is not black and white. Of course, yeah. there are a lot of nuances in the middle that you can't say that. So even Liberation Day that somehow is the 4th of July, like for you guys, here is not an everybody you know, celebration right. day. There are still some kind of uh, polemics. Well, and, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I, um, I went on a hike from uh, Bologna to Florence one time and um, saw some of the areas kind of like these Foibe, where they had um, shot the partisans outside of Bologna and sent them off the cliff. There was a huge massacre. Mar Marzabotto. I think mm -hmm. you're referring to Marzabotto where over uh, almost 2,000 people were massacred by Nazi. Yeah. yeah. It's a retaliation because you know that the rate was that if a partisan killed one Nazi, 10 Italians need to die. So that was the... The, the, the ratio, the, huh? Yeah, the ratio, yeah. Uh, so yeah, and that, that's it. So we, uh, I'm glad we had the chance to uh, make you know somehow conversational. And so this is what uh, we are talking about also here with the students that we covered this, and they had the chance to to meet this exile. The exile we had here, it was a um, former military. He was a retired general. His name is Antonio Laruccia. So his his story is crazy. So he, he was a six years old kid. You know, in that you know, that time, and so his father was a cop, a fascist cop, of course. But you know, even say you know, when I say a fascist cop, I mean he's fascist, right? But Antonio, when he was here, said, I mean he was a, a decent man, because uh, absurdly there were also fascist people that were decent people, and so since he was a, a good guy, when all the cops of the place where he was serving were arrested. All of them were executed, but the father. So that's why he managed to survive. So what happened? So the family left, the father was arrested. So Antonio, as a kid, they went with his family to Verona. He was waiting there for his father, waiting. Maybe not waiting, I mean, he didn't know anything about it. And so the father, Antonio said, he was a very decent man. So probably someone among the soldier of Tito they were a local, remind them, remember some favor, some, I don't know, good action the guy did. And so because of that, he was liberated. He managed to escape to make it back to Verona to meet his family. And so, and after that, they moved in different places in Italy because that was also the, uh, the exile. So being from Verona, they went to Milan and they went back to Rome and from Rome to Viterbo. Uh, and so they managed to have a good life because uh, fortunately the father, the father have, uh, had a good connection. But was not always the case. A lot of exiles uh, struggled for years uh, to find a job because they were coming from there. Right. So not license for selling anything you want. You know, so I know for stories of people that were in Florence or in Milan, they couldn't have a license for selling meat as a butcher or other license because they were from Istria, especially in the northern region, Umbria, Toscana, Emilia Romagna, all historical communist regions. So where um, Presidente della Provincia or Comune, il Sindaco, or in the administration were all left wing. So that there was no way that they could have a you know, a job. So for a long time was a very, very difficult situation for these people. No, it's fascinating. It's amazing. Yeah. And I'm so glad the kids are studying that. I really am. And that they got to meet those pe people. That's an amazing yeah. opportunity. Until they are alive, that's, you know, the, the living memory of this because I mean, the other lady that she lives in Viterbo, Anna, 
I mean, she's uh, 65 and uh, she grew up in the Quartiere Giuliano Dalmat in Roma. In Roma, there is this big neighborhood that they created in the 60s uh, for hosting all the exiles. So she grew up there. And so she has a story of uh, being there and then help put uh, with this old excite, excite people. And she said, I was lucky because my father has a job. But most of the other people, they didn't have a job. So they were needed to stand in line for getting the food, like in the, I do call the, uh, what's the word? Well, the, like the welfare office. Exactly. You know, when they assist, you know, Caritas, the Mensa, the Cantina, where you yeah. get food, you know? Yeah, the food the soup kitchens, I guess. Soup you're yes, yes. So, so imagine how humiliating it is for people that had a job. You know, the mother of Anna, she was the owner of a bar in the city in Istria. And one day for another, the soldier arrived to say, this bar is not anymore yours. That's the, uh, that's from, you know, that's Tato, from Bar di Stato. If you want, if you behave, you can keep working here. Otherwise, that's the door you need to go. Mm -hmm. She accepted to be there because she needed money. And the father went to Rome by himself for preparing the escape. So the father left first. He was in Rome for preparing the house. He found a job for selling because he was working with an insurance company there that also have a seat in Rome. And so then she managed to illegally to escape from there where she was working to meet the, 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 the husband, the future husband there. And so they had a life, but otherwise they are one day for another, she had a bar, she had a cafe and the day after she was an employee there. Mm. Wow. I had yeah. no idea about this, um, this um, number of Italians in that region. I mean, I, I knew that the, there was flocks back and forth and the fighting between, you know, the territory move, but I had no idea it was so populated by Italians. Yeah. And most of them, almost the total of the people that were there, were calculated about 90% of the Italians who were living there decided to leave. Because after the 47, the Treaty of Paris, Italians have two options. You can stay, but if you stay, you need to forget Italian as a language, as a culture. So you don't need to consider yourself anymore as, Ita as Italian, or you can go. So this, this was the options. So I know the, of story of people that, that they felt so radicated there that decided Italians or not, I want to be here. A family turns, turns apart because maybe the husband wanted to stay and the, the wife and the kids wanted to leave. Mm -hmm. So we know stories of people that separated their own families because of that. But most of the Italians, again, 90% and plus of the people decided to come back because they knew that they can wrap in the foibe or they didn't want to give up their own identity with you no know, stopping being a Christian because it was communist so you couldn't go to the church not speaking Italian me it was a trans identity transformation in you know just a transition that you had one day and the day after you can't speak anymore your own language crazy yeah yeah Okay. Grazie.